morning, everybody. It's Dr. Karen, and I wanted to pop in for just a couple minutes and share a little bit about a topic that has come up a lot among a lot of my readers and SLPs that I mentor in my paid programs, and that is imposter syndrome. Um, and so I wanted to take a couple minutes today and talk about what it is, how to deal with it, why it's so prevalent among SLPs, and, and, and again, how you can deal with it. So obviously, as therapists, we have a lot of pressure on us to be doing things, uh, be making different decisions for our clients, and a lot of times we can feel a little bit insecure about what we're doing. So that's pretty common. Um, I know that a lot of people, especially if they're new, if they haven't been in the field very long, um, they might feel self-conscious about different decisions, being put on the spot, being asked to make decisions, and also um, just a little bit um, have that feeling of, I'm a fraud, I don't really know what I'm doing. The thing is, is that I found after working with a lot of different SLPs is that that feeling doesn't really go away. And I see that pattern, not just in the SLPs that are very new, but also people who have been in the field for a long time. So uh, I wanted to just come out and say, it's, it's normal to continue to feel a little bit self-conscious, unsure of yourself, and to have that voice sometimes come back um, and to feel a little bit like you are still having a lot of things being thrown at you that you're not quite sure how to handle. Um, so with that being said, I wanted to just dive into what this, that what this actually is, what's actually going on here, and why it happens so often with SLPs. I will come out and say it. Um, I know that when I first started to go online and share things with a wider audience of SLPs besides just people in my building, I felt a little bit, um, well, not a little bit, a lot, um, really nervous to be sharing a lot of the information that I had live, um, to be sharing the information with a wider audience. And I kind of had that feeling of who am I to be sharing all of this? But the interesting that I thing that I found was that there are a lot of people with a lot less experience than than me um, that maybe had not, that weren't, didn't have as many credentials, that hadn't been practicing as long, and they were doing it. Um, they were doing what I wanted to do. They were online, creating programs for SLPs, creating products, presenting at conferences and things like that. And so I realized that a lot of those things were kind of in my head, uh, meaning that I just, for some reason, was telling myself this story about, I'm not ready to do this, I'm not good enough, um, I am not, I'm not qualified, but I started to realize that if I ever wanted to be qualified to do those things, to, um, to create products for SLPs, um, because I knew that there were some different problems um, that SLPs were facing because I was facing those problems, especially when it comes to language disorders, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But I knew that I, uh, if I didn't start doing those things, presenting in front of people. And if I didn't just kind of push myself off the cliff, so to speak, I would never become comfortable with those things. So a lot of times people have this thing in our head um, that, you know, I can't do this until I hit X. Like I had, I can't start seeing private clients until I've had X many years of experience or whatever. They think there's this magic number. Um, there's these, this magic credential that they're going to get that's going to make them feel ready. But the thing is, is that the only way to actually feel ready and to feel comfortable in those experiences or to feel more confident is to just start doing them and to get experience. So with me, my personal journey was I did do some private clients, but I also started creating programs for SLPs and just sharing the information that I had just sitting on my hard drive um, just sharing it widely with SLPs. And again, I also had in my head, well, I need to have, you know, 20 years of experience or some arbitrary number where I'm going to all of a sudden feel ready to do this. But the truth was, is that I just needed to start doing it. Um, and I'll be honest, there are still some times that I feel self-conscious about sharing some of the information, especially if it is a new topic that I haven't talked about. Um, 
you know, I still get butterflies in my stomach before I'm going to go live and feel self-conscious. I'm super self-conscious this morning because the other day I, um, on my office chair right here, I had my step stool right next to it and I went down to pick it up and I smacked my face on the side of my chair and chipped my tooth. So now I'm sitting here, you know, with this nasty chipped tooth online sharing this, but you know what? I just thought it's one of those things where I think you'll find that a lot of the people that you work with aren't really going to care about a lot of those things if you're sharing something that's going to help them. So when you are facing imposter syndrome, that feeling of, I'm not really sure if I know what I'm doing. One of the things that um, has been really helpful for me is that um, number one, knowing that it's normal for a lot of different people. So especially um, among graduate students, among new clinicians, and honestly, among clinicians that have been in the field for a long time, because there is a lot of, there are a lot of different things that get thrown on our plates. And so if you're feeling like, um, number one, if you're new and you're feeling like, oh my gosh, I, I thought I would be ready after grad school and I'm not, well, um, know that that feeling is normal. And a lot of those cases, while yes, you don't want to, um, move forward with certain clinical things without adequate training. One perfect example would be like, um, like I wouldn't do a trach and vent eval right now without getting training. That is a, a real fear. Um, so obviously I'd want to do some, uh, some training, but if you've had a lot of training in a certain area, um, one perfect example is language disorders. Um, with that particular area, I found that for me, I didn't, I had the language disorders course, I had the training, and I still didn't quite feel ready. So what I did is um, I continued to work with those cases and do my own research as I was, as I was um, learning my skill sets and developing my skill sets. So obviously there are some, some situations where, yes, you do need to be cognizant of safety and, and things like that, but there are other cases where um, just knowing, you know what, this feeling is normal because I, um, this is something new for me and it's okay for me to move forward. I know with, with language disorders versus trach and vent evaluations, with the trach and vent evaluation, if you do something wrong, the patient can um, go into cardiac arrest and, or not cardiac arrest, respiratory arrest, and then potentially cardiac arrest and die. With a language disorder, it's like, well, maybe you might just not get as much done in that session as you would have. So it's not a life or death situation. So with that kind of thing, um, I recommend giving yourself as much information as possible, but moving forward and not putting so much pressure on yourself and just knowing that that feeling of, you know what, I'm not quite sure if I know exactly the right thing to do, that feeling is normal. Um, and then that's also true. I've had SLPs who've been practicing for a long time thinking, you know what, I've been trying this and that with language disorders and I am not quite, um, I still don't feel like I'm getting it. So don't be afraid with that type of thing when it's not a life or death situation to just move forward with it. Chances are you're not going to hurt your students. You're not going to hurt your clients and you're probably going to do more help than harm in that particular situation. So that's the first thing, realizing that that little voice in your head, that's normal, but a lot of times it's really just a story that you're telling yourself. Um, and it's not necessarily something that you that needs to stop you in your tracks. So if those type of situations, if you're kind of like, well, I've had this, you know, I've been, I've been working as a clinician for a couple of years and I really enjoy these types of cases, but maybe I should go get this training. Uh, maybe I should go, um, you know, get a couple more years of experience before I take a client or create a course or create a product. I'd say go for it. Chances are you probably are more qualified than you realize. So that's number one, realizing that that's normal. And then number two, as far as how to deal with it, um, a lot of times we think that we need to... Um, it's, it's almost like we're we're getting ready to get ready. We're doing all these little things thinking, well, I'm going to start when I do this, this, and this um, because I want to feel really prepared to do whatever it is that I'm doing. Well, the thing is, is that a lot of times the thing that you actually need to do to get ready is just move forward. 
is just to put it out there and say you're taking private clients, is just to create that product and put it on Teachers Pay Teachers or create that course and start sharing it with SLPs. So whatever that is, a lot of times the, the actual strategy, even though it's counterintuitive, is, is not doing another course or training or whatever, even though those are good things to do. You can do those as you're building. But really, um, aside from just realizing that that feeling is normal, is the, the thing that you actually do is just move forward. Because there are a lot of things that you're just not going to know that you have to deal with until you actually are in that situation. And what's actually going to make you feel more confident is getting experience with that actual thing that you're afraid of. And you're not going to be able to get that. You're actually kind of feeding your fear by staying in that analysis paralysis preparation stage. And you're actually kind of fueling that anxiety more. Um, but one example, and again, not speech path related. Uh, my family and I just went skiing for a couple days in Colorado for the holidays. And um, we were, there were a lot of different places on the mountain that I, I'm a pretty good skier. I like to ski black runs, but um, my my husband was with my stepdaughter and she doesn't necessarily like to do that. So there were a lot of things where I was kind of like, well, I kind of want to go to this section over here, but I'm a little bit nervous. I don't know what's over there. So obviously um, with, with skiing, with something like that, I could go and ski off a cliff and obviously safety is an issue there as well. But for a lot of those runs, what I did was, yes, I took some steps to take before I actually did the thing. I might talk to some people that know the mountain really well and get an example of or get some information about the terrain. But in a lot of those places where I was like, you know what, I kind of want to ski in this area, the way that I actually got um, comfortable with it was I was like, you know what? I've got information about what's over there. I um, I know where I'm going. I've asked for directions. I have my trail map. I have my cell phone. I have been skiing for years on this type of terrain. I'm just going to go down. I'm going to take it slow, and I'm going to see what happens as I move forward. And everything went fine. So um, again, and then once I went down and I knew what I was dealing with, I felt a lot better and more confident. But I never would have felt confident if I wouldn't have actually just gone for it. Um, and so obviously everybody has a different level of, of risk with things like that. But if you're always staying in your comfort zone, you're never going to be able to get to that next level. So um, I wanted to share something that, um, and, and again, where I have the majority of my clinical expertise is in the area of language disorders. And the reason I talk about this a lot and the reason why this is a really good example of imposter syndrome is because it is one of those areas where I get a lot of, of, of SLPs that I mentor saying, you know what, I, I feel really like I've never had a good system for language. Even though there are there is research out there about specific techniques, it's kind of piecemeal and you kind of have to put it together on your own. And what a lot of people want is some type of curriculum. And the problem with that is that you can't have a curriculum for language therapy because it is, then that isn't therapy, it's not individualized. But you can have a framework that allows you to narrow things and you can look at the research and figure out, okay, what are the key areas that are going to inform what I actually do in language therapy? I have found for me that obviously number one with moving through imposter syndrome, Obviously, one of the ways was just, you know, understanding that it, there was a normal feeling. Number two was, was moving forward and seeing what came up along the way. I never would have figured out what problems would have come up that I had to deal with if I hadn't moved forward and just started working with a lot of different students in that particular area. Um, a lot of times we kind of assume, you know, we try to safeguard against different problems and challenges that might come up, but we're never going to really know what we need to deal with unless we're actually in that situation. So that's number two. But while I was doing that, while I was working through those problems and working through trial and error, that's when I was also doing a third thing, which is, you know, aside from understanding it's normal, moving forward anyways, um, is creating some type of a system or protocol as I'm as I'm tweaking and try, doing trial and error 
because what that does is if you have some type of a system that that you know works it structures things a little bit and it adds that predictability and it gives you that tried and true protocol that you can just go back to automatically and i found that when i whenever i got nervous if i had some kind of a system or a technique that i could fall back on obviously you can't control everything that's going on really you can't control anything but what you can do is control what you're doing and if you can go back to a technique that you know has worked that can minimize some of that feeling of insecurity with the skiing example um i know that um you know i know how to ski i know how to ski moguls and between trees and things like that but i also know that there are certain times where i'm like you know there might be a section where i'm like oh there's this big rock i need to ski around or this is a big icy section and it's um, it's really steep and I'm not quite sure. So I have a couple little techniques where I kind of, you know, slide down the mountain sideways or traverse across or whatever it is. I have those techniques in my back pocket where I'm like, you know what, if I get into some trouble and I'm feeling a little bit insecure and I'm not quite sure if I'm going to be able to do this part with good form, I have some things in my back pocket that I know are going to help mitigate that risk. So how I translate that to language therapy is that, you know what, I know that there are going to be things that are going to come up in my sessions where it's like, you know what, this kid isn't figuring out how to do this. Um, I need to, I need to modify and individualize. But if I have a set of tried and true protocols that I can just go to like that, and if I at least know my framework and my main focus for my therapy, even though there are some things that are a little bit unpredictable, I've got some of these set things that I can go back to that are my staples. And I have in my head that big picture view of what I'm actually working on. And so what that does is it, is it helps to provide that structure. And knowing that you have those things in your back pocket that you can do um, kind of automatically, then if you're anxious or nervous, a lot of times the more automatic they are, the better you know those techniques, it, you're going to be able to just kind of do them without a lot of thinking. And so, you know, when you're in a state of anxiety, you're a little bit nervous, you're not quite sure if you're doing the right thing, the more automatic that is and the less cognitive effort it requires for you to actually do it, the better. So that's why it's good for you to have that idea of what's my overall system for therapy and what's my framework. That's going to help you to feel a little bit better um, and feel more confident moving forward. The more you can do that, the more you have, the more techniques you have um, in your pocket that you can kind of pull out, the better you're going to feel. And you're just going to keep adding those layers on over time. And that's what's going to help you to build that confidence that is going to, um, there are going to be things that you can tell yourself when you get that feeling of, I'm not really sure if I know what I'm doing. And then you can kind of remind yourself, you know what? Well, you know, like, what if this happens? What if they do this? Or what if the student struggles with this? Well, if you've got a list of things that you can try, that's going to make you feel a lot better than feeling like you have nothing. So I wanted to just take a minute and share a resource that um, was pretty popular this week. Um, when it comes to language, this is kind of my equivalent of those skiing techniques that I just talked about. My my strategies that I have that are kind of my safety net when I get into a place where I'm a little bit out of my element and a little bit out of my comfort zone. Um, what I remember to, um, when I am working with those language therapy cases, and I'm just going to kind of go through this post that I shared earlier this week. Um, because a lot of a lot of the feeling of imposter syndrome when it comes to language therapy is because a lot of SLPs kind of feel like um, they don't have that certainty of some type of a um, tried and true protocol when it comes to language. Now, I absolutely felt like this when I was first starting to treat language disorders, and um, and I I get a lot of complaints from other SLPs who feel like that. Um, and then the thing is, is that it's it's that feeling of uncertainty of, you know, I'm, I don't really know where I'm going. And as a result, they're questioning their expertise. They kind of feel like they're jumping around from skill to skill. So maybe they are moving forward. They're doing those first things I recommended, which is, you know, saying, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and understand that it's normal to be a little bit nervous and unsure of myself. I'm going to move forward. 
And then they're kind of like, all right, I'm moving forward. I'm working with these cases and I'm kind of jumping around from skill to skill, not really sure what my students need to be doing. And so what happens is a lot of times when they're doing that, they're trying to try a little bit of this and they're trying a little bit of that. And they're trying to cram all these skills into their language sessions because they don't know what else to do and they feel like nothing's working. And a lot of times they're afraid of missing something. So the way that we get around that problem when we actually work through that feeling of, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm doing in language is to understand how to treat those root causes, understand what are those tried and true techniques that I can go back on that are going to work. So what I have found is that my tried and true strategies for language are all centered around metalinguistic awareness and direct instruction of specific skills that aren't necessarily taught directly in the classroom. So a lot of students are catching on to these types of skills because um, like in the, in the general education curriculum, um, they're learning them implicitly. And so they're moving along and everything's fine, but our students need them to be taught directly. They need to, them, they need to learn them explicitly. And so that's where we come in and that's where we can start to make a difference with metalinguistic awareness and start to make our students aware of how language works because they're not catching on to those things on their own. So by focusing on metalinguistic awareness, that's where we can start to really focus our therapy and start to make that sustainable progress. And so when I got to that, that stage, again, remember it's, you know, knowing imposter syndrome is normal moving forward anyways, but then creating that tried and true process that you can follow as you're working through. My process is all around meta skills because I was starting to realize as I was working through that tried it, um, through the, uh, that trial and error that I didn't have enough time to get to all those skills that students need in therapy. And when I was jumping around and trying to teach my students everything, I was just spreading myself thin and I was confusing my students. So what I needed to do was figure out a way that I could change the way that my students think about language because that's what's actually going to make a difference. You're not gonna be able to teach your students everything that they need to know in therapy. So you wanna figure out how to focus on the root cause and you wanna do it in a way that's going to get your students to think about language differently so that they are going to be able to take what you teach them and then apply it to other words. So one example that I give is that a lot of times people are like, you know, like, how do I get through this whole tier two word list? And what I always say to them is your goal in therapy, don't write goals for them to know this word list or for them to know this many tier two words. That's not what you're wanting to do. You're not going to get through be, going through in therapy and trying to get them to like check off all these words that they know. What you want them to do is to again, use those words, target them, study them, but you want to teach them a process for thinking and learning about words. And if they can understand that process, that's going to be better than you checking off all of these words on a word list. Because if they know that word list, great, they might forget it the next week or they might not, then you're going to have to do it again in the next unit and you're probably not going to get to all the words anyways. But if you can teach them a strategy for thinking about words differently, then yes, you can use some of those words as probes to study words and you should probably use tier two words while you're doing it. But if you can teach them a process for thinking about words, they're going to be able to take that and study the other words that come up in their curriculum and you're going to be teaching them those meta skills that are essentially going to be teaching them to fish instead of just giving them the fish. So I actually covered this in depth in my course language therapy advance. And, um, and I show you a whole framework of strategies that are going to help you build those vocabulary skills that are going to get to the root cause of language processing issues that are going to help you take all of this, that massive laundry list of uh, things that you might be working on in language therapy and just really funnel it down to the things that are going to get you to those that root cause. Um, but I've actually created a free packet for you. It's called the Power of Meta Vocabulary Booster. And it is a free download for SLPs that 
shows you a framework and shows you some examples of how you can start building that meta focus. And this is actually some of the strategies that I outlined in this packet are a couple of the techniques that I outline in language therapy advanced, but obviously in the, in the full program, there are many different other strategies. We take it way further than that. But if you want an idea of how to start adding that meta focus in your therapy right away so that you can shift from giving your students the fish and you want to shift to actually teaching them to fish, then I'd love to share this with you to show you um, how to start creating that framework. And again, this is the third step of dealing with imposter syndrome of, okay, you've moved forward, you understand that it's normal, and then you figured out how to actually have some kind of a tried and true strategy that you can fall back on when you get into those situations where it's like, you know what, I don't know what's going to happen in this therapy session, and I don't know how they're going to respond to it. But if you have that process you can fall back on, that's going to help you to feel even more confident. And the more you have like this, the, the easier it's going to be for you to move forward. I found that having these tried and true techniques have been so key when I have done things that are a little bit out of my comfort zone. Number one, going live on Facebook where hundreds and thousands of different people can see me talking about language. Um, and so having these tried and true techniques in my back pocket that I know work, that I've explained a million times, that's going, that always helps me to move forward when there is some other area that is uncertain. So if you have something as in your career where you're kind of like, you know what, I really want to do this, but I feel a little bit unsure of myself. Well, if you got those things that you know work, those therapy techniques um, that you know are going to work and you're, you've got a whole list of things, then, then that is going to help you. You're going to ha have that to fall back on when you're doing this other thing that might be more challenging for you, whether that be um, selling your services um, for private private practice, whether that be going into a leadership role where you've got to start teaching some of these techniques to new clinicians and supervising others, whether that be creating a product or program for SLPs to mentor other SLPs. If you've got these techniques in your back pocket and you really understand how to do them and you're confident in using them, it's going to be a lot easier for you to move forward and do some of those things that are out of your comfort zone. So what I'm going to do, um, what I did, what I shared in my post earlier this week is because um, originally this came out as an Instagram post um, and I can't share links on Instagram. So what I had said at the bottom of the post was just send me a direct message that says vocabulary booster and I'll share how you can get your free copy of the vocabulary booster. But what I'll actually send you if you direct message me is that there is a page where you can just go and sign up for it on your own. I am going to share that link below this video. So you can just go, you can direct message me if you want um, and just say vocabulary booster. I'll give you the page where you can go and sign up for that. But I'm actually going to share in this, in the comments below this video, I'm going to share a blog post where I describe the framework that I teach SLPs in Language Therapy Advanced. So I'll share that blog post with you. And then I'll also share the direct link to the Vocabulary Booster. In that blog post, there, there is, you can find the link for the Vocabulary Booster in that blog post, but um, I'll actually share the direct link for the Vocab Booster as well in the comments below. So that is, again, for me, one of the key things that's helped me overcome imposter syndrome and I hope would love to help you do the same and help you to move forward with your language therapy confidently or whatever whatever other SLP leadership career building types of goals you have, whether it be starting to take those private clients in the area of language and literacy, whether it be going after a position where that requires you to um, supervise other clinicians or whether it be putting out your own program. I'd love to help you become more confident. So um, just send me, again, send me a message and say vocabulary booster, or you can use the links that I'm going to share below this video. Thanks so much, everybody, for listening.